Hi all, it's Hannah here and welcome back for the last video in module one. As promised, in this video I'll be describing historical as well as modern implementations of linear free energy relationships here in the Sigmund group. In the first part of this video, we'll talk about the origins of our statistical modeling workflow, with a focus on why the group thought it was necessary to develop more sophisticated linear free energy relationships. This will flow into a discussion on our modern multivariate linear regression strategy, which we'll, we will cover in depth throughout the next modules in this course. The focus of this module is how have linear free energy relationship modeling strategies evolved over time in the Sigmund group. And we finished the last video with this slide, and at this time I described some of the limitations of Hammett style linear free energy relationships. Early parameters were experimentally derived and sometimes pretty hard to interpret. Only one substituent effect could be probed at a time, and often the linear free energy relationship models were not predictive, although they were quite mechanistically insightful. Despite these limitations, linear free energy relationships remain a powerful mechanistic tool, and in the early days of the Sigmund group, they were used quite frequently. Given the group's focus on asymmetric catalysis, linear free energy relationships were often used by the group to relate substituent effects to the difference in energy of diastereomeric transition states, or rather observed in antioselectivities. The key assumption in these types of linear free energy relationships is that the difference in energy of diastereomeric transition states, delta delta G double dagger, is related to the enantiomeric ratio through this equation. And obviously this should call to mind the curtin hammett principle. And as a reminder, this principle suggests that the product distribution of a reaction reflects the difference in energy between rate limiting transition states and the energy of the products. But as we all know, enantiomers have essentially the same energy. One particular example from the group is a linear free energy relationship study led by Jeremy Miller in 2008. This, con this study was conducted after our group discovered that oxazoline ligands could be used with both aldehyde and ketone substrates in an antioselective Nozaki Hayama uh, Kishi allylations or NHK allylations. Particularly, this study probed how differential substitution at the proline moiety of the ligand affected the enantioselectivity of the transformation. Miller began this study by interrogating the substituent effect by systematically altering the steric profile at the proline substituent and found a good correlation between the enantioselectivity of the benzaldehyde allylation products and Charton steric descriptor which, as a reminder, is an empirical parameter that Charton based off of Taft's original steric descriptor. <clears throat> but like I said, oxazoline ligands are useful in the NHK allylations of a number of substrates, and Miller was interested in evaluating the sensitivity of this reaction to ligand steric effects for additional substrate classes. To do this, <clears throat> To do this, the enantioselectivity of the allylation of hydrocinamaldehyde and acetophenone were also correlated to Charton values to generate a series of three different linear free energy relationships shown here. <clears throat> the slope of these lines, psi, is analogous to Hammett's row values, and it also describes the sensitivity of a reaction to different substituent effects for each substrate. As you can clearly see here, benzophenone is, <clears throat> or excuse me, benzaldehyde is most sensitive to the ligand steric properties and hydrocinamaldehyde is the least sensitive to ligand steric effects. Although we won't get into it here, uh, Miller also noticed that in previously reported data for enantioselective transformations with oxazoline ligands, steric features for the substrate rather than the ligand could be correlated to the observed enantiomeric ratios of products. And while traditional linear free energy relationships were definitely helpful here in understanding the steric effects at play in the system, it would be really interesting to concurrently look at substrate steric effects in addition to these ligand steric effects. 
This relates to one of the limitations we previously discussed, which is that traditional linear free energy relationships only probe one effect with each correlation. <clears throat> and so chart and steric parameters were quite popular in the physical organic literature for some time, but the supremacy of these chart and steric parameters, as well as the notion that linear free energy relationships could only probe one substituent at effect at a time, were challenged by our group in 2012, when Kate Harper and Elizabeth Bess constructed linear free energy relationships, describing the enantioselectivity in the peptide catalyzed desimmetrization of bisphenols. Uh, and this reaction was developed by Scott Miller's group at Yale. <clears throat> in their investigation, Harper and Bess found that charting parameters were ineffective at describing the steric effects that are important for selectivity in this desymmetrization reaction. It's obvious from looking at this plot that there's no correlation between charting values and observed enantiomeric ratios. But if you look closely at Harper and Bess's report, you'll find that they credit this poor performance of chart and values to the fact that the parameters are based on a spherical model, which doesn't actually account for asymmetry about a primary bond axis. And so Harper and Bess therefore turn to another set of more sophisticated steric descriptors that do indeed have the capability to describe asymmetry of a substituent. These steric parameters are called the steramol descriptors, and they were developed by Verloop and coworkers in the 1970s. The three most popular of these steramol descriptors are B1, which describes the minimum length of a substituent, or the, excuse me, the minimum width of a substituent with respect to a primary bond axis. B5, which similarly describes the maximum width of a substituent with respect to that same bond axis and L, a length parameter which describes the total or maximum length of a substituent, once again, with respect to that primary bond axis. <clears throat> and while no single steramol parameter was highly correlated with the observed enantioselectivities for this desymmetrization, Harper and Best demonstrated that the minimum width and the length parameters when taken together furnished an adequate model of the observed selectivity of this transformation. They were able to assess the effects of both parameters at one time by performing multivariate linear least squares regression. We still use a very similar strategy in the group today to build multivariate linear regression models. And the topic of linear least squares will once again uh, be covered in depth in module four. Since 2012, our group has been continually improving our linear free energy relationship strategy by implementing and developing new molecular descriptors, including descriptors that account for electronic and stereoelectronic effects in addition to steric effects as we've shown here. For example, in 2016, our group showed that molecular descriptors computing, computed using DFT could be used as parameters for multivariate linear regression. At first, computed IR stretching frequencies and intensities, along with partial atomic charges, or maybe more specifically, computed natural bond orbital electron densities, were the most popular descriptors that our group implemented. But since then, we've also implemented computed parameters such as NMR shifts, surface area, and polarizability, as well as more advanced descriptors like percent varied, vol percent varied volume. Developing additional parameters is an ongoing area of research in the group. And in module three, Ellie will discuss these parameters in depth. But it's definitely worth noting now that the use of computed molecular descriptors opens up many possibilities for describing molecules, especially when we compare it to the empirical de descriptors of Hammett's time. The last major advantage of our group's modern statistical modeling strategy compared to traditional linear free energy relationships is that our models can be used to predict reaction outcomes and or mechanisms in addition to just understanding those mechanisms. A particularly compelling example of this came from our group in 2019 when Dr. Jolene Reed mined data from over 350 nucleophilic addition reactions to imines, which were catalyzed by binyl-derived chiral phosphoric acids. 
I'm not going to talk about this study in a separate video, but I want to highlight that in this analysis, Jolene was able to use our statistical modeling strategy to develop a model that differentiates between the two nucleophilic addition mechanisms, which proceed either through the Z or the E amine. This was our group's first example of modeling a large number of variable reaction conditions, including changes to the substrate, nucleophile, and catalyst, but also different, differing solvents, differing additives, temperatures, and concentrations of all of the reaction components. Other members in the group have also used statistical modeling to predict ideal substrate catalyst pairs through extrapolation. <clears throat> so to summarize this video and module one as a whole, I'll once again return to our list of limitations of Hammett style linear free energy relationships. But this time I'll focus on how our group's modern statistical modeling strategy compares. While early descriptors were empirically derived, the parameters we use now are predominantly calculated using DFT or molecular mechanics. And for the most part, the physical interpretations of these parameters is quite clear. Using our modern statistical modeling scheme, we're able to test the effect of varying many different reaction properties from substrate substituents like Hammett did all the way to solvents. And finally, perhaps most importantly, the models that we make today have the capability to simultaneously interrogate reaction mechanism while aiding in reaction optimization through their predictive abilities. <clears throat> in the next videos, Jen, Ellie, and Jake will describe how exactly we go about making these mod models from practical and theoretical standpoints. Uh, but I want to thank you all for joining me for module one. Uh, and good luck with your statistical modeling goals.